se mide, se que está en la bolsa, que está en la bolsa, se mide, se que está en la bolsa. Market days in Chichitanuengo, in the highlands of northwest Guatemala, are becoming a bit of a tourist attraction. The locals here are Mayan Indians. They've been living in these parts since long before the Spaniards came. The women still wear their traditional shawls and headdresses. The people are poor, so their exotic handicrafts come cheap. You do see armed soldiers here and there, but after 36 years of guerrilla insurgency, the country is now at peace. And it's a beautiful country too. Yet back in 1982, the tourists never came to Quiche province. What came rumbling up instead from Guatemala City was death. On behalf of the rich oligarchy, and backed by the fiercest army in the region, the Indians are being massacred. They are being cut to pieces, as if the army has come to see them as animals. One of the few contemporary television accounts of the Western Hemisphere's most terrible 20th century atrocity. At the time, the Reagan administration dismissed such talk as wild exaggeration. But this American knows that genocide is just what happened. He's flown in from Oklahoma City to meet me at Dallas International Airport. This has been his jumping off point for more than 20 years, to Argentina and Chile and Bolivia, to Bosnia and Kurdistan. He's not a tourist or a businessman, or despite appearances, an old retired spy. Dr. Clyde Snow, forensic anthropologist, is an expert on bones. And just two and a half hours flight away, there are bone yards in plenty. Try to throw a rock around it out here without hitting a mass grave. There are a lot of them, unfortunately, and um, we've only really, in all the years of the teams that work down here, scratch the surface. We're on our way to visit the team of young forensic anthropologists that Clyde Snow has been training since he first came to Guatemala 10 years ago. They were students then, but they've had so much practice in these hills that now they're among the world's foremost exponents of the art of exhuming a mass grave. It was totally crazy. You know, these people, we're, we're going to be digging up here in this little village in the middle of nowhere, were not a threat to world peace, not, especially not the children, not the women. The army first moved into Quiche province in late 1981. It was determined to eliminate the last stronghold of a 3,000-man guerrilla force which had been challenging its rule of Guatemala ever since the early 1960s. Soon terrible rumors began to leak out from these secret hills of civilians massacred, women raped and tortured, villages burnt. A church report said the army's operations have resulted in a horrendous human tragedy. Amnesty International published verbatim accounts of widespread massacres. Yet the US government did its best to shift the blame from the army to the left-wing guerrillas. It has been established that some of the alleged atrocities never occurred. In most cases known to have occurred, it has not been possible to determine whether the guerrillas or the army was responsible. It appears more likely that in the majority of cases, the insurgents have been guilty. But slowly in recent years, the lush, well-watered hills of Quiche have given up their secrets. The team that Clyde Snow trained have played their part, and they're still doing it today. A half hour's trek above the settlement of Sholkwe, we're told, we'll find them in a cornfield. And so indeed we do. How you been, partner? 
pretty good. Nice to have you. Yeah, great. How many, uh, how many graves you got? Yeah. We've got five open right now. Five open. Yeah. Waiting. Yeah. Yesterday Waiting I thought it was four. Yeah. Oh no, we got another one. Oh. Hey, so far, the team has uncovered 14 skeletons. Almost all of them old men, women, and young children. Somewhere in the cornfield are another 50 bodies, give or take. The team knows this for sure because some of the men who buried their families, their wives and children, parents and in-laws, are here to help dig them up again. Para no pegarle a los huesos, o sea, no nos vamos a ir muy hasta el fondo, ¿eh? Men like Baltazar, who's been digging trenches for two days, trying to find the grave where he buried his sister. That was on March the 2nd, 1982. Now, 17 years later, the rich volcanic soil is brushed away from shattered skulls and bones. Each body will be photographed in situ, each bone meticulously bagged and labelled to be taken back to the laboratory in Guatemala City. This is a big step right here. But even before the skeletons are removed, Freddy Pecciarelli and his team from the Foundation for Forensic Anthropology can tell much of the story from the bones. That is a male skeleton. This is a female skeleton that happens to be his wife, according mm -hmm. to testimony. And this is her sister. And uh, the lady sitting on the corner of the grave, which I don't want to point to over there, is uh, uh, the daughter. Possibly now, three gunshot wounds to the head. Yeah. yeah. So it basically corresponds with uh, the testimony that says that these victims were either shot or macheted. So we have both yeah. machete wounds, okay. cutting wounds around the cervicals, and a gunshot wound to the head. About well, when I see gunshot wounds to the head, we're talking about you know, execution. It's not just, not as random as you'd get if they just sprayed people. Somebody was in pretty close and pretty methodical. Later, when the bones are moved, they'll find bullets from Israeli assault rifles, used exclusively by the Guatemalan army. That comes as no surprise to Andres, Miguel, and Salvador. They remember all too clearly the day the army arrived in Xolque. Sunday, the 28th of February, 1982. <laughs> Porque, no, porque yo sé que, que los hombres que van a perseguir los soldados, sino que, que yo, que yo soy mujer, no nos hace nada. Mejor sale que, pues está bueno, yo salí. Por eso yo lo dejé a mi mujer, a mi casa, a mi familia. Entonces yo, cuando yo salí, me fui en esa serra. Today, only the ruins of the church and an abandoned schoolhouse show where the village once stood. From the hill behind the village, Andres watched the soldiers going from house to house. They rounded up everyone they could find, including his wife and children, and took them up the path towards the cornfield, out of sight. Also hiding in the hills that day was Miguel and his three children. His wife had gone to the nearby market town that morning. He never saw her again. Ya cuando subí a tres, como a las dos de la tarde o tres de la tarde, cuando oí el gran ruido aquí, que esos es que están matando aquí ahorita, que los pobres que gritando, gritando, y que por qué será, oír disparos y gritar, pero no, yo no voy, yo no, yo no lo veo porque yo estoy en el otro lado, por los cerros, pues no, no, no se ve, va. Entonces así es que me quedé yo con, con tres huiros, sin, sin mamá, sin nada. <risa> It was two days before Andres and the other survivors emerged from the hills to bury the dead.
Andres covered his family with a blue plastic sheet before filling in their grave. It's preserved their shoes and clothes, as well as their bones. His wife, his two children, aged four and five, and his father-in-law, four victims of one unremarkable massacre. The Guatemalan Truth Commission, which reported earlier this year, collected detailed accounts of more than 400 separate massacres in the Western Highlands in those years. There were about 100,000 individual victims. Around 95% of those deaths, the commission said, were attributable to the Guatemalan army and the vigilante groups it armed and controlled. The commission's chairman, a German lawyer, was unequivocal. La commission concluye que en el marco de las operaciones contra insurgentes realizadas entre 1981 y 1983 en ciertas regiones del país, agentes del Estado de Guatemala cometieron actos de genocidio en contra de grupos del pueblo de Maya. The use of the word genocide drew wild applause from the victims' relatives. It did not amuse the generals. But they are safe enough, at least for now. The Guatemalan government agreed to the setting up of a truth commission on condition that it did not attempt to name the perpetrators of the crimes that it described. La verdad es la, la palabra primera. The Catholic Church was not so squeamish. In April last year, the former Bishop of Quiche, Juan Garadi, masterminded a detailed account of the Thirty Years' War. It did name names, generals, colonels, captains. Mientras no se sepa la verdad, Las heridas del pasado seguirán abiertas y sin cicatrizar. Three days later, the outspoken bishop was dead, bashed to death in his own garage with a concrete block. In the 15 months since, the priest who shared the bishop's house has been arrested and then released. But only now is a new prosecutor daring to focus his attention on the evidence that points to the involvement of military intelligence. If a bishop could be murdered with impunity a year ago, what chance of justice have the Mayan Indians, whose relatives are 17-year-old skeletons? Freddie, what do you think in the current climate here, the chances that the perpetrators of these, this particular massacre will ever be prosecuted and found guilty of their crimes? Um. Slim to none, I would say. And according to testimony, uh, the people responsible belong to the Guatemalan military. It would be very difficult for the prosecutor's office that belongs to the state, and it's part of the judicial system of the state, would go after another sector of the state at this moment in time. And yet the work, hard and hot and gruesome, and seemingly without an end in sight, goes on. What keeps me going personally is, uh, well, you know, the opportunity to be able to help one person at a time, to be able to identify you know, maybe his children, her mother. Um, also the fact to be able to contribute, to tell the real story of Guatemala. And so people, not only in Guatemala, not only my children, but everyone would know what really happened here. At least we're putting the evidence of these massacres on the scientific record. And it's good, hard, solid, forensic evidence. And that makes it difficult for the revisionists to come in 20 or 30 years from now and say, oh, this stuff didn't happen. And so it's hard to argue against a skull with a gunshot wound in the back of the head. It is impossible sitting in Washington um, to determine what is going on in the highlands of Guatemala. All you can do is rely on the professionals who do the reporting, which is precisely what we did. As Assistant Secretary of State for Human Rights under President Reagan, Elliot Abrams was responsible for the State Department reports which consistently downplayed allegations of mass killings by the Guatemalan army. The embassy should not be saying that the government committed these acts unless it can really prove that the government did commit them. 
Um, and uh, presumably at that moment, the embassy felt that it did not have adequate evidence to, to say that. But what was the embassy in Guatemala telling Washington? Last year on President Clinton's orders, around a thousand classified documents were released to the Guatemalan Clarification Commission. They've been collected and analyzed by the National Security Archive, a non-profit pressure group in Washington, D.C. The documents represent no more than a tiny fraction of the full secret archive. Nevertheless, they are revealing. There are CIA reports. There are Defense Intelligence Agency reports. There are embassy cables. We have, in fact, one CIA document from 1982 that was produced by the station in Guatemala City that specifically describes one of the, uh, one of the massacres that were taking place in the Ischil Triangle at the time. And the, the reporting officer is quite clear about, about what's happening up there. It says, the well-documented belief by the army that the entire Ishil Indian population is pro-guerrilla has created a situation in which the army can be expected to give no quarter to combatants and non-combatants alike. We do have material indicating that the United States was certainly aware of, of the kind of violence that was going on. And so my, uh, my opinion of the human rights reporting that was going on at the time is that it was profoundly politically driven and that they did not want to know or report on what was happening. <laughs> Veterans of the Reagan administration make no apology for their political agenda. These were the years when America was obsessed with ousting the Sandinista government in Nicaragua. Guatemala was even closer to home. It seemed clear to us that if you had a Nicaragua in Guatemala, what you've got is a Nicaragua, that is to say, a Soviet-style government armed by the Soviet Union lousy with Soviet and East German and Czech and other secret police agents on the border of Mexico. The priority was defeating communism. The Reagan administration was funding the Contras in Nicaragua and the army in El Salvador. But there was a Carter-era ban on military aid to Guatemala. The Guatemalans were supplied instead by Israel and Argentina but only America could supply the helicopters they needed to take the war to the highlands. The Reagan administration wanted Congress to lift the arms embargo. As the Guatemalan Truth Commission pointed out, the lives and deaths of Central American peasants have never weighed much in the scales against the commercial and strategic interests of the United States. Que hasta mediados de la década de los 80 hubo fuertes presiones del gobierno de los Estados Unidos de América y de empresas norteamericanas para mantener la arcaica e injusta estructura socioeconómica del país. That simple truth is still denied by many North American Cold Warriors. You can't explain away Latin history and Latin culture and say that everything that happens in in Latin America is America's doing. There is such a thing as Guatemala. There is a country, there is a people. The fact that we've had a democracy since 1789 and they haven't is not because we imposed military dictatorship on them. In fact, that's exactly what did happen when Guatemala attempted to escape its past. That past began when Spain set up its Central American capital in Guatemala in the 1540s. Ever since, the country has been ruled by a tiny land-earning elite, and the Mayan peasants have been ruthlessly exploited. Though civilian presidents have sometimes come and always gone, Guatemala was effectively ruled by the most ruthless and efficient army in Latin America. And in the 1950s and 60s, that army and its ferocious intelligence branch was created, armed, and trained in counterinsurgency doctrine by the freedom-loving agents of the USA. The United States created the killing machine that went on to murder and torture 
hundreds of thousands of people. And perhaps most importantly, the United States poured millions of dollars, tens of millions of dollars into training. They trained the Guatemalan military how to raid houses. They trained them in surveillance. They trained them in interrogation techniques. Uh, and we have now, years later, the declassified CIA and Defense Department manuals to prove it. Um, I have something from, for example, as early as 1954, which is called A Study of Assassination. And it describes in the most chilling and bureaucratic terms how to murder an individual or individuals. It, it even goes on to, to uh, show in graphic terms how to enter a room with 10 people sitting around a table and murder them one by one. So these documents give us a very rare glimpse into the inner workings of uh, a counterinsurgency strategy and tactics that we were very much on the ground helping to design. One of those tactics was the deniable disappearance. Every 19th of June, the few remaining stalwarts of Guatemala's labor movement mark the day in 1980 when 25 trade union leaders were snatched by armed men, never to be seen again. Over the years, 45,000 Guatemalans, guerrilla leaders to be sure, but also students and professors, priests and social workers and peasant leaders, have simply disappeared. The tactic has been used from Argentina to El Salvador. But the very first mass disappearance in Latin America took place in Guatemala in 1966. The kidnapping of some 30 communist leaders and their associates and their secret execution was the product of an operation designed by the United States, by the CIA and the Agency for International Development at the time. Last March, President Clinton made an official visit to Guatemala. In a first for a U.S. president, he openly acknowledged that America's support for repressive regimes here and elsewhere in Latin America had been wrong. I will reaffirm America's commitment to shed light on the dark events of the past so that they are never repeated. But for those like the young team at the Foundation for Forensic Anthropology, who are presented every day with the gruesome consequences of their country's past, a mere acknowledgement of responsibility is not enough. I don't think uh, you can change the responsibility or the involvement the United States government had just with one speech. Um, I haven't seen any difference before or after the speech. Um, I think if, they, if the United States government really wants to contribute, they're going to have to do it in a more direct fashion with projects, with some other way. Um, speeches only go so far. Well, you're right, there's, there's extensive uh, fragmentation here. Clyde Snow has made his contribution to Guatemala as to so many other traumatized countries in the world. I used to be the Yankee expert, but over the years as I've worked with a the team, they've turned themselves into true professionals. What I want the, the teams to do is develop a sense of independence and self, the self-confidence that they need to operate on their own. The tragic irony is that that's exactly what the U.S. secret agencies achieved in Guatemala. They created a monster, which later they were powerless to control. On the way back from Xolquay, we were passing through the village of Shish when the heavens opened. The people said the village school is on the other side of the river. When the rains come like this, the children have to risk their lives to ford it. But there's no money for a bridge. After 30 years of war and massacre, these Mayan communities are still desperately poor. Last week in Washington, the Congress voted to return one and a half trillion dollars to the American taxpayer over the next 10 years and then it slashed a couple of billion from the budget for foreign aid. I've heard no one talk about Guatemala, but why would they? The Cold War's over, and this tin-pot little country 
really doesn't matter anymore.